Self-defense or a war of aggression, can Israel's current assault on the Gaza Strip be justified as self-defense despite growing allegations of war crimes? Would senior Israeli political and military leaders bear personal liability for their offenses and could they be prosecuted by an international tribunal? This is Inside Story. Hello, I'm Mariam Namazi. The UN Human Rights Council has voted for a resolution condemning Israel's offensive. The resolution says Israel's military operations in Gaza have resulted in massive violations of the rights of Palestinians. They're accusing Israel of systematic destruction of Palestinian infrastructure and of targeting civilians and medical facilities. Meanwhile, 27 European and American legal experts, lawyers and academics said the manner and scale of Israel's operations in Gaza amount to an act of aggression and a war crime. Todd Bayer reports. The images of a war that's already left more than 900 Palestinians dead, shelling of schools and UN facilities, allegations that Israel is using controversial white phosphorus weapons and attacks like the one that wiped out 30 members of the Samouni family when the compound they were sheltering in was shelled and shot at by Israeli forces. Attacks that are prompting aid and international groups to ask if Israel is breaching international law and could be guilty of war crimes. Prima facie evidence of possible war crimes and crimes against humanity is emerging daily. This council must not ignore it. It must use its authority to call for an urgent and thorough independent and impartial investigation. It must call for perpetrators of war crimes, crimes against humanity, and other serious violations of international law to be held to account. With war continuing and Israel refusing to allow independent monitors and international journalists to see the destruction, human rights officials at a UN Human Rights Council say they can only suspect war crimes are being committed. We are deeply concerned about attacks that may have caused indiscriminate or disproportionate loss of civilian life in violations of the rules of, law, of war. Most notably, the January 6 attack near a UN school housing displaced persons which killed a reported 40 civilians. The Fourth Geneva Conventions defines a war crime as murder or ill treatment of civilians and destruction and devastation not justified by military necessity among other acts of violence. Supporters of Israel's offensive told the council that the only war crime being committed is by Hamas. They say Hamas is using civilians as protective shields, which is why the civilian death toll is so high. The truth is that Hamas is committing a double war crime, deliberately targeting Israeli civilians and hiding behind their own Palestinian civilians. Hamas hides their guns and bombs in mosques. They booby trap schools. They put their terrorist headquarters under hospitals. Read the New York Times, we've seen it. Hamas doesn't commit violations of international humanitarian law. Their entire raison d'etre and modus operandi to murder civilians, to destroy a UN member state, negates the very notion of international humanitarian law. The UN Human Rights Council voted for a resolution condemning Israel's offensive. The debate over war crimes will likely continue in the days and months ahead. For Inside Story, Todd Bear, Al Jazeera. Well, joining us now are our guests in Jerusalem, Amos Giora. He's a professor of law at the University of Utah and a former Israeli military prosecutor. In Paris, Avril MacDonald, lecturer on the laws of war at the University of Groningen in Holland. And also in Jerusalem, Fred Abraham, senior researcher at Human Rights Watch. Thank you all of you for joining us. Avril MacDonald, if I can begin with you, can Israel's assault on Gaza be justified as self-defense? I think from listening from to your uh, introductory piece there, it's very important to make the distinction between the two bodies of law that uh, would apply here. The law relating to the use of force, so the use of force to begin with, and then the, um, the justifiability of particular uses of force within that context of a war. So and the first would be the uh, law relating to the use of force, and the second is the law of war, the international humanitarian law. Um, and I mention this because, of course, the self-defense argument that Israel is using uh, is really an argument that goes to the first body of law that I've mentioned, the law relating to the use of force. So when a state is attacked by another state, uh, in principle, that state has a right to resort to self-defense. 
uh, and the force that it used in self-defence should be necessary and proportionate. Now, let me just say, as far as that's concerned, that it's not completely clear uh, to what, what is the scope of that right in relation to the use of force in self-defence against a non-state actor. Having said that, of course, the UN Security Council did recognise that there is such a right in principle following the 9-11 attacks. So let's say that Israel does have such a right. Um, then the question becomes, uh, you know, what, how does it actually operationalise the use of force within that context? And this is where the allegations of war crimes uh, occur. Now, the, the, the violation of the law relating to the use of force could itself be a war crime, and that would be the war crime of aggression. And then um, there could other be, also be other war crimes, and your, um, your journalist mentioned a few of those, such yeah. as indiscriminate attacks, um, the use of human shields, uh, collective punishment, and so, uh, so on and so forth. Okay, so well, you, you've, um, yeah, you've, put that, you've put that very nicely into context for us. So let me put one of those points to Amos Giora. The Hamas rocket attacks are deplorable, but do the scale of those attacks and the impact that they have actually amount to an armed attack on Israel? I think that if we go back over the past three years and we think that over 6,000 Qassam and guard missiles have been fired into Israel after the Israel disengaged from the Gaza Strip. And if there are today one million Israelis living within a 40 kilometer radius of the Gaza Strip who are under daily, if not hourly, threat of those missiles coming from Gaza Strip, I think it's clearly an attack. And I think it's an ongoing attack over the course of three years, if not more. Again, when I mentioned the three years, that's the post Israel disengagement from the Gaza Strip. But it's also important to know the, the rockets were being fired before that. But in terms of post disengagement, three years, th 6,000 missiles. I don't think there's any doubt whatsoever that the perpetrators of this, the initiators of this, is Hamas. And I think that Israel is fully within the country's rights in, all, in any way you want to look at self-defense in terms of responding. Fred Abrams, when we look at the issue of self-defense, uh, many argue that Israel itself didn't abide by the six-month truce, that they did not ease the 18-month blockade of Gaza. And then on November 4th, uh, Israel actually raided the Gaza Strip and killed a Palestinian, which led Hamas to reta retaliate with rocket fire. So you could argue that it can't be self-defense if, if Israel provoked Hamas. You well, know, so far, ways, I agree yeah, with uh, both of your... Oh, I'm sorry. I, was, I, I agree with both of I your guests because there's a distinction... Ahead. Fred Abrahams, okay, if, you, if you could just let uh, if you could just let Fred Abrahams uh, answer that question, I'll come to you in just a moment. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, please. There's a key distinction between uh, uh, the use uh, uh, in bellum and use uh, use ad bellum and use in bello, which is you know the reasons you go to war and then how you behave in war. And the the, the first uh, the first of those is really not Human Rights Watch's uh, issue. We we don't take positions on whether states on acts of aggression and whether states have the right to, to de self defense. So you know, in answer to your question, I mean, we can go back and forth on who broke it. Well, did they really lift, lift the siege, uh, the blockade of Gaza, did Israel uh, or, or did Hamas violate the truce by uh, launching these attacks? Our concern is the behavior uh, of the parties in this conflict, and there's no question Hamas is violating the laws of war by launching these Qassam and from a humanitarian because, perspective, uh, they have no targeting it's mechanisms, a dire situation at the Gaza Strip, is it not? Civilian areas. It could constitute a war crime. And at the same time, uh, whatever Hamas and other armed Palestinian groups do does not in, in no way does it justify violations of the law of war uh, that are committed by Israel. And, uh, you know, we're seeing a, a very serious pattern uh, and consistent reports now about indiscriminate attacks and disproportionate attacks, uh, as well as okay, some but, other but, issues, I mean, potentially from a, but, the targeting of from, uh, from medical From a humanitarian teams. perspective, the situation in Gaza is dire, is it not? The humanitarian situation, we are in a humanitarian crisis even before this began, 18 months of the blockade with restrictions on electricity and fuel, which has affected the water sewage, the sewage, the water pumping system. There was a humanitarian crisis prior to this. Right now, we're in a humanitarian cr catastrophe. Uh, and so, you know, uh, this is all uh, not only civilian protection needs and, and in relation to the humanitarian law violations, but simply people who need electricity, water, uh, uh, clean sewage. I mean, it, it's a, I can't understate the degree of the of the emergency at this point. Avril McDonald, even if the self-defense argument does apply, though the facts on the ground might suggest that that, that argument is very far-fetched, under international law, Israel's use of force must be proportionate, yet over 900 Palestinians have now been killed. You know, the fact is 
really, you can look at, you can spend hours arguing about whether or not, you know, Israel was entitled, who started it, who, you know, um, it, it's irrelevant in a sense. Once the, con once the conflict has begun, then the laws of war will, will um, regulate the use of violence within that situation. And the, the question of the necessity and the proportionality of the force, use of force arises under both bodies of law. Let's just leave to one side then the use ad bellum, the, the law relating to the use of force. Um, Israel, is, to some extent, is, is misleading the public by trying to conflate these two bodies of law and by suggesting that, you know, because it's acting in self-defense, assuming it is, that it's able to use the level and type of force that it is using within the laws of war. And, you know, those are two entirely separate bodies of law. Um, I am not on the ground. I cannot make an assessment as to what is actually happening. But my sense from what I read in the news is that both parties to this conflict are committing violations of international humanitarian law through, in the case of Hamas, the, uh, certainly the use of human shields, the complete disregard for the lack of the principle of uh, distinction, Amos, Amos principle Bura, of distinction, uh, and let, so let forth. Me, and let me Israel put, as well is committing the, war crimes. Let me put that point about a disproportionate use of force to you because Palestinian civilian casualties are mounting. Thousands have been injured in this assault. We've seen the destruction of schools, mosques, houses, uh, UN compounds, government buildings. It's very difficult to argue that this is a war, that this is a conflict of two equal armies. Well, first of all, the, the Hamas is not a state. There's not an army of Hamas. And in terms of the proportionality discussion, it's true. There's a there's disproportionate force available to both sides. Israel has tanks and planes, and, and Hamas, thankfully, doesn't. So the question isn't in terms of proportionality, in terms of the availability of what weapons you have. The question is whether the force is being used proportionally and in a discriminating fashion. So again, going back to how we began, it's important, you and I, I think, are going to disagree. I don't think there's any doubt this is self-defense and that Hamas has been firing the missiles indiscriminately, randomly, for three years. Okay, but then let me ask the you this. Does Israel distinguish between military and non-military targets? I think that in the context of, of what appears to, what obviously is, as you all com, com, report incorrectly, in the world's most densely populated area, there's an absolute requirement to be as careful as possible in the context of a military operation. But, and the but's important, international law requires you to minimize collateral damage. It doesn't require you to have no collateral damage. And that raises the, question, the point that one of, the, my, one of my other uh, co-presenters mentioned here earlier. The whole issue of human shielding, I mean, if you, the, the finger of blame clearly needs to be blame, put at on Hamas's doorstep. But then if you know that the civilians are, are there being used as civilians. human shields, why are they being targeted in the first place? Well, first of all, that's the whole issue of proportionality here also requires you to, if there are legitimate targets, you have to be able to attack those legitimate targets. With respect to human shields, here in terms of if you want to talk about violations of, of laws, it's clearly Hamas who's doing that. Okay, well, uh, well, it's time for a short break now, but when we come back, we examine specific incidents in the war on Gaza and ask if they can be justified. Stay with us.